for the subpopulation of the COVID that had critical or severe illness, 96%. 96% of that population had low vitamin D levels. Mm. And then you take the those who had really mild illness, 96 for them of the, that population had normal vitamin D levels. So you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand there's probably some significance to this. Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body Mind Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Seem Lund, and our guest today is Dr. Joseph Mercola. Dr. Mercola runs the largest health website online. He's also a best selling author of several books. In this episode, we're going to talk about a free ebook Dr. Mercola made with other doctors about how to stop COVID cold. This episode is brought to you by Katsu Training. Katsu bands incorporate blood flow moderation training that trick the body into thinking that it's lifting heavier weights than it actually is. When traditional weightlifting requires you to reach 70 to 80% of your one repetition maximum to stimulate muscle hypertrophy, then Katsu achieve that effect only at 20 to 30%. So it's perfect for treating injuries or use when you don't have access to heavy weights. Research about Katsu bands also shows it lowers blood pressure, speeds up recovery from injuries, releases stem cells, builds muscle, burns fat, and prevents age-related muscle loss. These things are a game changer and I use them almost every day. If you want to try out the Katsu cycle bands, then use the code SEAM for a 10% discount at katsu-global.com. That's katsu-global.com and the 10% code is SEAM, S-I-I-M. Dr. Mercola, welcome back to the show. Well, great to be with you, Seem. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to talk with you. And uh, it's currently we're recording this podcast in early, in early September 2020. And like mm-hmm. the first kind of major coronavirus uh, wave has uh, passed. And during the summer, there was like pretty low amount of cases uh, relatively. But we can yeah, probably expect that there's going to be some second wave or a third wave. <laughs> we, we, we don't know because that's how like pandemics tend to work uh, in history, that there are several waves. So uh, how is the situation in the United States at the moment? And what do you think is going to happen like in the next uh, few months? Well, it's, it's difficult to predict. Who, who would have been able to predict this? But more than likely, they'll in, uh, inject another virus, reactivate this one or a new one, and continue the, um, I, I believe, planned interventions to create more fear in the population so that they can increase their tyrannical control. So the reality is that this infection isn't that serious. The CDC recently in the United States, come out. I think it was last week, admitted that nine the actual people who died from coronavirus, specifically from coronavirus and other factors, was ninety six percent less, ninety six percent, and maybe ninety four percent. It's only six percent of the people who are de- who are formally labeled as COVID deaths are really COVID deaths. Mm. I mean, they were they were marking people as dying from COVID who would die in a motorcycle accident or die from cancer and happen to have the infection, even though there was, all they did was have the infection, did not kill them. So when they did a more serious analysis, it was a relatively small percentage. So, but the end result is that I, I think it's a, uh, it, it's a wake up call for, for many and to recognize that there are strategies that we can uh, uh, incorporate with our lifestyle that will help improve and upregulate our immune strategy, immune system, rather than relying on the conventional recommendations, which everyone knows is a bunch of hogwash. Right. I mean, they are, they, they are absolutely ridiculing and suppressing any alternative to conventional medical therapy. And what is their medical therapy? You've got expensive interventions like remdesivir, which is an antiviral. And then of course the upcoming warp speed, uh, coronavirus vaccine, which has never been able to be successfully produced in over 10 years of trying, they've never had a successful event. And, and uh, it looks like in some of these trials, the phase one trials and two trials, they have 100% of people getting them are having side effects. And they actually, AstraZeneca just had to stop the recent trial, uh, put it on hold at least because one person just had a just absolutely disrupted immune system with neurological complications. So this is exactly what you'd predict. This is a, uh, there, there is essentially no safety set testing being done. They skipped all of those uh, precautious interventions to accelerate the distribution of this vaccine. 
Mm. And it's not going to work. People are going to suffer. I mean, we have historical mm. precedents in the United States. Well before you were born, seem uh, we had the swine flu epidemic in 1976. And they launched a swine flu uh, pandemics, I think it was called. It was a vaccine. And it caused hundreds of people that have complications and many of them died. They had severe neurological complications like Ian Beret. They, this was, uh, I think like for, for, it was almost 10 years before the uh, Vaccine Compensation Act was passed. So they awarded $3 billion in damages to these people who were suffering wow. from the swine flu or the swine flu vaccine. And then they stopped it. They just shut it down. Hmm. So I suspect something similar will happen here, except as you know, in the United States, there is no immune, they have complete liability against any damages the vaccine companies do. I mean, it's just like the perfect storm for right. disaster. Yeah. So anyway, that, it's a long tangent to the point <laughs> that I want to focus on things that not only your audience who is incredibly literate and sophisticated with respect to their understanding of these strategies, but you know, to, to remind them of these things and to give them strategies that they can also share with their friends and family who are not going to be as sharp as they are typically, or at least not be as sharp, but as knowledgeable in these areas. And, and, you know, they haven't done the study and the due diligence they need to. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, there is quite a lot of controversy about these things. And, uh, yeah, like, regardless of any case, uh, you'd still need to have like some, uh, certain level of uh, your own immune system functioning uh, you know uh -huh. e even if it even if it is uh, like a super lethal virus or even if it's like a very mild virus it doesn't matter <laughs> like a like having a foundational immune system having working it functionally and properly is uh, still one of the best uh, strategies that you have and uh, yeah keeping it uh, optimized yeah and what what these the conventional narrative fails to mention is that assuming that the vaccine program works which as i mentioned i, I do not believe it will the way it works is by enhancing your own immune response. Yeah. It's not like a drug that kills the infection. Yeah. And, I'll, and because your audience is so literate, I am going to share with them. So this is an encouragement for them to stick around. A, si a simple strategy that costs less than a penny that has been shown to be highly effective at eliminating the actual severe complications of, of uh, coronavirus. So in other words, you're short of breath, you feel like you're going to die, can't breathe, uh, coughing, have a fever, and literally hours later, you're better, if not cured. So it's amazing stuff. And uh, we'll talk about that later. But I want to talk about these other ways that you can build up your immune response first. Because, the, you know, like anything in life, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that adage is so true when it comes to just about anything, including viral infections. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe let's start with uh, some of those uh, strategies. And uh, you shared me with this uh, PDF as well, or ebook, uh, where you cover a lot about uh, vitamin D. So let's start with that. Like, how does vitamin D affect, uh, like, yeah, maybe, maybe a... how does how does it affect like the coronavirus outcomes? Uh, what the study have been shown so far? Yeah, well, let me give you a little backstory. And I've been promoting vitamin D for over twenty years, uh, and really have been one of the activists and, and physician journalists to catalyze an interest in vitamin D in the conventional medical community. And now, physicians around the world do not balk at at considering using vitamin D therapeutically in their patient population. That wasn't the same twenty years ago. That was not the, the scenario. There was a great reluctance to do that. Great fear the, the, the concerning with people damage people. They had no understanding or appreciation that dose that it did anything other than build bone density or help integrate calcium into the bone structure. But it does, it has so, it has unbelievable benefits. We've yeah. known for such a long time that it radically, it reduces heart disease and cancer by about 50%, just simple vitamin D and autoimmune mm -hmm. disease. So this is independent of its impact on your immune response, but it has enormous benefits to the immune system. So I put together, right, uh, I would say in May, maybe May or June, I, I took a month off and just, just scour the literature, put together this PDF, which is available, and we'll tell you how to get it, uh, that reviewed the literature and has about 300 references on there. And then I created a, a simplified version for people who don't want to dive deep into the literature. But it's real easy to understand because there's a, you know, I re 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 rewrote it like about a dozen times and cut it down and cut it down. I probably cut it down by 50%. And then it had a lot of simple graphics and illustrations to, to make the points e easier to understand but essentially it has a, a wide number of beneficial functions uh, uh, with respect to your immune system. Uh, the immune system can typically be 
divided into two large categories with uh, the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. The adaptive immune response is basically your T cells making antibodies, which is what uh, we typically measure when you give someone a vaccine. They measure the, the humoral cell mediated, or not humor, um, the humoral antibody produ production. So the, um, and it does help with that, but it helps with, vitamin D helps with both. It helps with the innate immune response. And one of the most powerful ways it does this is by improving the physical barriers in your body, the epithelial cells that line so many of your tissues. And by creating tighter junctions and adhesion, they prevent infiltration of many immune responses when you have activation from, a, from an infection. So that is a really important way. And then it also does a, a pretty interesting uh, uh, function on the adaptive immune system, your T cells, your help of T cells. Uh, I'm sure everyone's heard of the cytokine storm that's associated with COVID. And, and for those who don't know what a cytokine is, it's a small protein that serves as a signaling molecule and to tissues in your body. And with respect to COVID, it has two primary functions. One is it, um, it primarily affects the inflammatory response. So it can make what's called pro-inflammatory cytokines or anti-inflammatory cytokines. And vitamin D works on both of those pathways to your benefit. It, it, it helps to suppress the NRLP3 inflammasome and the production of... Um, things like TNF-alpha and interleukin-2 and some of these other pro-inflammatory cytokines so that when the, the infection comes in, it reduces the consequences of that, that uh, activation of the immune response. So, and then it activates the anti-inflammatory cytokines. So, you, you know, it really helps quite a bit. But th th this uh, beneficial physiological response takes a while to occur. It doesn't happen overnight. So you realize that's why it's so important to know this beforehand and get your vitamin D levels up to speed before you need it. This is where the ounce of prevention comes in. Yeah. So interestingly, so why would, be inter why would we be suspicious that it might be useful? Well, there's a number of correlation studies and of course, correlation is not causation. For that, you need a randomized control trial and those are indeed being done where you can scientifically prove without any question that this thing works. Uh, right now, we only have incredibly strong epidemiological support for this. But uh, let me give you one that just highlights the, the unbelievable effectiveness of this. There was a study of uh, 212 patients, I believe, in Southeast Asia that had COVID. And for the subpopulation of the COVID that had critical or severe illness, 96%. 96% of that population had low vitamin D levels. Mm. And then you take the, those who had really mild illness, 96 per them of the, that population had normal vitamin D levels. Yeah. So you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand there's probably yeah. some significance to this. And there's a wide variety of others. Uh, uh, and vitamin D has been definitively shown scientifically proven to actually reduce the incidence of viral respiratory infections, not specifically yet at this time of the of SARS-CoV-2 or, or COVID-19. So, um, but, you know, it's, it's just crazy not to, to focus on this. So yeah. in recognition of this, I put together a site, which is one of the keys of why I wanted to get together with you. It's called stopcovidcold.com. Stop covidcold.com. And it has a number of benefits. The, the, one of the cool ones is, and I'm sure almost everyone on your, in your list who takes the, there's a, a little quick little two minute test. Uh, it has about 10 questions or so. And you answer the questions and it will give you a, a, an assessment of what your risk factors are for COVID. Or if you will be at low risk, very low risk, medium, high, or very high risk. And you'll know. And not only will you know the level of your risk, but it will give you an individual customized response based on your answers as to what you can do to improve it. Uh, because it focuses on two primary things. One is the vitamin D, and then the other is something that you are so well adept at, and that is metabolic flexibility and insulin sensitivity. Hmm. So those are the two primary things that you can do. And you know your audience is well-trained in this. Most of the site is focuses on vitamin D, but we definitely do go into the metabolic flexibility just to address simple time-honored strategies that you've been teaching for a long time, like time-restricted eating and 
and uh, you know macronutrient distribution, cyclical ketosis. Uh, but the, the key thing is, is that the site probably, and that you can download the PDF that you referenced. Uh, that's like 30 pages with a few hundred references. And there's no charge. There's no opt-in email. There's no email grab. You're not going to get something in your inbox. Uh, you get, it's all free. Yeah. And there's a simplified PDF for those of your friends and relatives who aren't as deeply interested in the science and the support for that. So, uh, it's, that's all it is. It's a very simple site, and it, mm -hmm. we're, and there's strategies that you can use to download an image over your Facebook profile and hashtags and things. So we're trying to get the message out to people, which is one of the reasons I reached out to you to, to stop yeah. COVID cola. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. So to say that uh, you know that's so all like you know, like you said, we don't have like a vaccine. We don't have the vaccine for the common cold either, and uh, and you know who knows how long it's gonna stay around. So one of the key ways to kind of end the pandemic is to build up like a certain threshold of uh, herd immunity as well as uh, people you know just uh, not being that affected by the virus so to say and uh, surviving it better and yeah like one of the ways of doing that is to just uh, keep your immune system strong and you know maintain metabolic flexibility and uh, assess uh, those other comorbidities that tend to uh, cause like worse outcomes uh, for COVID-19. Yeah absolutely that's the most rational approach uh, social distancing and wearing a face mask. I mean, that's, I mean, all that's going to do, I mean, it had potential and I'm not sure that the, the studies actually support those interventions. In fact, there's quite a few that actually dispute them being effective, but assuming that they were, all they're going to do is limit the time expo frequency to this. So the people yeah. are, are still going to be exposed to it eventually. They're just going to delay it. Yeah. Uh, so that if you had this high spike of people initially, which was a concern, clearly is valid concern. Everyone was concerned about the initial thing of this because you're going to overwhelm the hospital system. But it really never happened to maybe a slight extent in New York, but not really. And uh, I actually interviewed Aaron Osleski, who is known as, the, wrote a book about this, the epicenter nurse, who was uh, actually a Florida resident and, and volunteered and went up to New York in a hospital called... Uh, Elmhurst Hospital, which is in Queens, which is the absolute epicenter of the pandemic in the United States and right in the middle of New York. It is the worst hospital that was in the entire country. And she was there at the worst time of the epidemic. So mm -hmm. and she just documented the craziness that was going on. If you, if you haven't encountered that, it was, it's a really, it's frightening in many ways because of the way the abuses that occurred and how um, essentially freedoms were just obliterated. They prevented any of family members from coming in. So the medical staff had complete authority, tyrannical authority of what they were going to do with patients. And patients had nothing, they had no say in, in, the, uh, in what, what, what the results were. And if they had, there was any neg medical negligence involved, they were completely insulated. They were, there was no, they were not held liable for any of their actions. It, it was just crazy. And, and interestingly, they put Virtually everyone they put on a ventilator died. And you remember, of course, that was the big thing. I mean, they had companies all over the world making these ventilators. The ventilators didn't work because it doesn't address the underlying reason why people are sick. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, do you think like uh, one of the reasons why like we had like a like a reduction in cases uh, during the summer because of you know just sunlight and uh, vitamin D, people getting more uh, just vitamin D and uh, coming out of the winter. Yeah, I think that's probably a big factor, but uh, there's a, many people who believe that uh, just the increase in the humidity has a lot to do with the decreased pathogenicity. If it, it, it's the drier climates that make the virus more infectious and more likely to be transmitted. Mm -hmm. So obviously with summer comes typically increased humidity. I mean, where I live in Florida, it's pretty high humidity most of the year, but it does go down a little bit in the, in, in, in the winter. But, but you go into northern climates where you actually have the heat on, uh, that, that humidity will typically drop well below 30% and maybe even below 10% unless you're using a humidifier. So th those are the conditions that tend to increase the uh, virus's ability to be infectious. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the uh, seasonality and latitude is a pr pretty um, important factor. Uh, uh, but what about like, um, you know, there's, th there is a talk about how like, black, black people have been uh, more affected oh, yes. by COVID-19 because, because of their uh, lower vitamin D. Yeah, it's not just African-Americans. It's, it's anyone who has a uh, really deeply pigmented skin color. 
So that would be a large number of people. And that's really the focus, the, the initial focus of the stopcovidcold.com was for uh, people of color and uh, the elderly, which is the other population. Uh, the elderly for a number of reasons. The, 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 the common denominator between both of those populations is, is low vitamin D levels. Uh, for the blacks, because they have de deeper pigmented skin, which prevents the, the sunlight from penetrating. They, need, they can get the vitamin D, but it takes two, three, four times as much exposure to get it. Mm -hmm. And then the elderly, many times for similar consequences, reasons, they, they just aren't going outside. I mean, they're typically right. confined indoors and they do lose the ability to produce vitamin D, even if they had that exposure, because as you age, unless you're healthy, I mean, I suspect you at 110 would be producing vitamin D like crazy, just like you were now. But most people don't have your resilience and in increased, uh, not increased, but high quality physiology. Mm -hmm. And you can maintain it. I'm convinced you can maintain it. It's a very old age. But most people don't do that. They just start to engage in behavior and lifestyle changes that, you know, they're in the retirement mode and they just, don't exercise. They don't do the things that, that they need to do to, make, to maintain their health. Mm. So what, what, what would be like one of the best ways to just keep your vitamin D optimal? And what is the, like, the optimal range? Okay, the optimal range is a great question is, I believe, somewhere between 40 and 60 nanograms per milliliter. And that's the units that we use in the United States, uh, in Estonia, Europe, and Canada many parts of the world, they use nanomoles per liter. And to get that, you have to multiply the nanograms by 2.5. So maybe 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter. Uh, and those are ranges that you can easily reach if you are exposed regularly to sunshine, as I am. Uh, I have not taken oral vitamin D for over a decade. And my vitamin D levels are very healthy, right? And the, they're actually 70 nanograms per milliliters. So, um, but most people, especially now that we're approaching the winter and most people watching this are in the Northern hemisphere. If you're in Australia or New Zealand, South America, it's a different story. Of course, you're approaching summer. Uh, but there we're pretty much at the point where you, m the majority of people in Northern hemisphere are not going to really be making much vitamin D now the, 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 that even with optimal sun exposure. So you're almost going to have to switch. Now, if you do live in more subtropical areas like Florida, uh, or at high altitudes, then you, that, that's not true. You can probably go longer. But for most people, they're going to need to take some vitamin D supplements. And I do discuss that in the PDF and the dosages because ideally, you know, vitamin D levels are kind of like your, high, your blood pressure levels. Um, you don't know what they are. You can't feel them. So you have right. to test them. You have to measure them. So that's why we highly recommend getting a, a test. Uh, you can empirically dose yourself. And we have... Uh, recommendations for that. But the best thing is to know what your levels are and then adjust your dose based on the levels. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know your levels and you don't have regular sun exposure uh, and you're not acutely sick, then about 8,000 units a day is probably a good dose. That's what we find. We've worked with grassroots health, roots, grassroots health who've tested over 15,000 patients and comprehensively surveyed you know, dozens, if not hundreds of aspects of their lifestyle and found that about 8,000 units was what required to get it into the healthy levels. Uh, but if, you've, if you're acutely sick and you, you have low levels, then you may want to take 100,000 units once or twice and then 50,000 and gradually go down to 10,000. But uh, hopefully people aren't at that, that, that point and um, you know, they can uh, do it more slowly and carefully. I think the best way, a lot of regimens call for once a week dosing to increase compliance, but I disagree with that. I think you really ideally should take it every day. I think it's a better, more physiological strategy. Mm -hmm. And even though probably it does, there is some benefit to taking large doses at once if you're acutely sick. I think there's better strategies that work far more effectively to actually treat this that more than likely everyone watching this will not need because if you are healthy and resilient, if you come down with this, you're just going to have maybe a little cough or maybe a little fever, you know, feel out of sorts for a day or two and that's it. Uh, but if you're, if you know, your friends and relatives who aren't following your lifestyles are going to get sick and some of them could potentially come, to, uh, come down with this and not make it out of it. So there are some simple things that you can do 
that would actually radically improve your body's ability to defeat this infection. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I also think yeah, so it depends a lot on your own, uh, you know, starting point of where what your levels at. So if you're already oh, yeah, like yeah. severely deficient, then you you may need to like supplement it to kind of boost yourself back to the optimal range. But if you're already within the optimal range, then you don't need to. Uh, like uh, supplement it, um, or at least not as much. So yeah, it's a first thing. Yeah, is to probably just right. get get tested and uh, see uh, what your levels at. Yeah, as I said, if you if you do have access to sun, you don't even need it at all. I haven't taken it for a decade, so this is not like a recommendation or endorsement. People run out to the store and get vitamin D. I mean, you could theoretically do it without any. It's not going to pr pragmatically. It's going to be way less than five percent of the population, probably under one percent, who are not going to need any vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Because even if they did live in an area where they can do it, they're, they're going to be working inside and they're not going to be assiduous and diligent about sun exposure. Yeah. Yeah. And vitamin D is, is a pretty common deficiency already. So a lot of people, yeah, oh, yeah. because of like, yeah. sedent sedentary well, lifestyle and being indoors. It's interesting. It's about 90% of the population is vitamin D deficient. 90%. And interestingly, 90% of the population is also metabolically inflexible, mm. <laughs> which are the two biggest risk factors in my case. Probably, I, could, I suspect you could throw an age in there, but it, I think maybe vitamin D and metabolic flexibility may be even a greater risk factor than age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I do agree. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty easy to fix or like, at least it's oh, uh, yeah. not, not easy to fix, but it's like, uh, it's not something mysterious oh, it or... <laughs> it is easy. You just have to be careful. I mean, it's, and it's relatively expensive. Even if you're taking a supplement, vitamin D is one of the least expensive supplements that we have. I mean, it's almost free. Mm. It's so cheap. Yeah. And you don't have to be obsessive compulsive and get the best brand on the market because it's pretty, it's, it's hard to mess up vitamin D. Uh, and the, the side effects, there's virtually no side effects. I mean, you'd have to take like bottles and bottles at a time of a high dose <laughs> brand to you know, for right. months to have any risk. I mean, we don't recommend that, but it is, it has a very wide threshold of safety. So, yeah, you know, the downside is virtually non-existent. Yeah. Uh, and what about like uh, sunlight? You know, I don't, I don't think there sunlight. is, sunlight. there's not many sunlight. side effects. <laughs> no, there is the actually sunlight probably has potentially more dangerous side effects. Cause if you're not, I mean, for most people, it's not a big issue because they know you, you should never get sunburned, but you can, especially at the beginning of the season, it's pretty, many people get sunburned, you know, and mm -hmm. that's dangerous. That's very, very dangerous. And it can absolutely increase your risk for certain skin cancers. So you have to be really careful there. Yeah. Yeah. And, but how, how do you, how would you like uh, prevent that or how would you protect against it? Well, it depends on the color of your skin. So if you really have a pale complexion and it's the beginning of the season, you know, it's like the early spring, you haven't, your skin hasn't seen sun for four or five months then you know you all go out and it's just maybe two three four minutes or you know just be pay very careful attention to look at the color of your skin the moment it turns the, the lightest shade of pink you get you get out of the sun mm -hmm. so because then and then over time your body builds up a protective response that creates this, this creates this pigment called melanin which you know shields you from the uv radiation and you could take supplements too like astaxanthin uh has been known to almost double your exposure time before you get injured so yeah. that's a really powerful carotenoid antioxidant, one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, usually extracted from uh, seafood algae, microalgae. Yeah. And uh, which, which is a, like a good point. I want to mention that, you know, as the xanthin, it's a, like a yeah, antioxidant. But if you are, let's say, if you're eating a diet high in vegetable oils and omega 6 fats, then uh, you actually shorten the period when you get burnt because of the um, you know oxidized fats oh, and uh, this it's, it's like a like a deadly combo where if you have this metabolically dysfunctional diet composed of a lot of vegetable oils then you also are going to get get the negative side effects from the sun sunlight and uv radiation much faster because of the oxidation that occurs yeah and, and that is in my view a subset of metabolic flexibility because these these oils will radically reduce your insulin sensitivity so mm -hmm. to me that's one of the most important strategies and it's interesting how they call them vegetable oils and technically <laughs> they are but they're really seed oils and all the big big ones like canola corn and soy they're all genetically modified uh so not only are they terrible from that perspective but I believe the excess omega-6 linoleic acid is probably more poisonous at the levels that most people are consuming them than the glyphosate. Mm. 
hmm. because it just metabolically ruins your system. It's one of the worst things that you can do to your body is have an excess of that fat. Yeah. Uh, and you just got to avoid those things like the plague. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, that, I mean, to me, they're far more harmful than sugar. There's no comparison, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. not, not that you should avoid them 100%, but if you're just eating regular food, if you're eating grass-fed beef, you can get more than enough omega-6. There's no, you, you, it's hard to avoid. But if you're eating processed food, foods that are loaded with these vegetable oils or, you know, interestingly, one of the largest sources was going to restaurants. But now, at least in the United States, mm -hmm. they've almost destroyed every restaurant except, you know which restaurants they didn't destroy? No. Take a guess. You know, the fast food restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> so the fast food restaurants that have exploded. There are, many of them are yeah. buying more stores now and opening up new outlets because that's pretty much the only place you can go and eat. They've almost wow. shut down all the regular restaurants and put them out of business because of the restrictions. Wow. So it's a and and in some ways it's good. Uh, well, and, and it really isn't, but you know because it, it, most of us are not going to go to fast food restaurants. I mean, the bulk of the population will, and that's sad. But if you're not going to go to the that, to either of those, then it forces you to eat at home, which is what you should be doing in the first place. Yeah. You know, creating your own food from healthy whole foods would be the best strategy to improve your health. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And yeah, in a way, like if you, I, I don't know how many people usually go to restaurants, uh, but even if they don't go to restaurants, then they still, you know, use these same vegetable oils um, in their home. In, they use it for cooking and uh, like most processed foods are full of it. So even even yeah. then they can't really avoid it. You have to kind of be quite uh, yeah. diligent and uh, deliberate about it. Yeah, but see, the thing is, even people who are diligent and obsessive about it when they go out to a restaurant they kind of it's been my observation that they kind of put that on the back table and they say well it's a restaurant so i can just assume they're doing the right things <laughs> bad decision bad <laughs> assumption you know because you can almost be guaranteed it's it's the very very rare restaurant who is not using these these seed oils industrially processed seed oils loaded yeah. in omega sixes yeah. so and, and they and they just they, they somehow just forget about it they don't understand that they're getting loaded with this stuff hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, but at the same time, you can also like mitigate some of the damage, like maybe astaxanthin can protect against it. And uh, I, I believe like uh, spirulina and algae does it as well, or uh, like xanthoxin. Well, so well, yeah, I mean, the ultimate, but ultimately these fats, fatty acids get integrated into the cell membranes and they stay there for a long time. So, and then of course they're, they're predisposed to oxidative stress. So you get like four, four HNE uh, sure. metabolites that are, incredibly, uh, you know, these carbonyls that radically destroy the body system. Uh, but the, the best thing is not to put them in your body to begin with. And then yeah. you have to worry about it. Yeah. So, yeah. and you could actually, there are, and if you, you know, it's worth doing a test, um, like a, a fatty acid test to see exactly what your levels are, to mm -hmm. see how much of this uh, linoleic acid you have in your body. Uh, because you might be surprised. You might be thinking you're doing the right one thing, but maybe not. And it's not terribly expensive. It's like some of these tests can be outrageously expensive, but it's, it's reasonable. You can get it for easily for under hundred dollars. So. Yeah. yeah. It's always good to know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, especially if you're trying to, you know, me measure something or change mm -hmm. a particular habit. Uh, but uh, I want to touch a, a bit more on uh, vitamin D. Like are there any other like nutrients that uh, may help the vitamin D utilization or like, maybe inhibit it? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Thank you for asking that and reminding me that um, the when you may, your body makes vitamin D or you swallow it, it's typically uh, just simple vitamin D is what we call it. Uh, but it needs to be hydroxylated. An OH molecule needs to be added at two different positions. Typically, it's done in the kidney and in the uh, liver. Um, interestingly, we've now that's what I was taught when I first started learning about this, but now we know that the immune cells actually have the enzymes. They're actually, um, um, the enzymes are similar in the liver, but they're in these immune cells. And that when you have, they have vitamin D, the D, it, these, uh, they, it gets activated to its, to its active form, the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And there are some minerals that are particularly useful to, to catalyze this uh, process. And one of them is magnesium. So magnesium is really key. And we find that many people who take therapeutic doses of vitamin D and don't seem to improve their levels is because they're magnesium deficient. Mm. And 
there's about almost as many people that are magnesium deficient as are vitamin D deficient. So it's pretty good strategy, very safe. Typically, it could be a little more expensive than vitamin D depending on which kind you get, but hard to overdose on because if you take too much, vitamin, uh, magnesium is a laxative and you just poop it out. So pretty mm -hmm. safe threshold there. Uh, so I would definitely take it with magnesium. And then the other, other vitamin that's useful is vitamin K2. It, it works, has many of the same functions as vitamin D and it works synergistically with it prevents any potential vitamin D toxicity. So it's a good combination. Usually you don't need too much. It's a lot more expensive than vitamin D. It's typically about 150 micrograms is what you need. You could take more. It's pretty low, pretty high safety level, but it is a bit pricey. So you have to be careful. Yeah. 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 Magnesium is uh, another crucial one. And most people are deficient of it. And like magnesium deficiency also like uh, promotes uh, immunodeficiencies and it kind of, uh, reduces the cytotoxicity of uh, like uh, T cells and NK killer cells as well. So if you are magnesium deficient, then uh, you're more likely to also catch like some other sicknesses, uh, including like influenza or what, whatnot and some other viruses. Yeah, it, it's responsible about for uh, activating about four to 500 different uh, molecular reactions that we know of. So if you're deficient, you're going to, it's not only the immune system, but there's a wide variety of your physiology that's going to be screaming for assistance and help so definitely get your magnesium it's it's really an important one mm, yeah definitely um okay like maybe not, now let's talk about the metabolic flexibility aspect as well so um how would how would you sure. like how do you define it and how do you can achieve it that's a good i mean it, de it depends how scientific and detailed you want to go i mean if you I, if you really want to go deep in the weed i think joseph craft who's now passed, he's an MD pathologist. He wrote a book about, on diabetes that had a pretty good description. And he, he does like a, a, a gluc instead of a glucose tolerance test, he does an insulin tolerance test. So, and what is that? Essentially you give this bolus or this challenge of glucose, like 75, 100 grams, which is not a healthy thing to do, but it's a, it's a test. Right. And you test it and then you do the baseline and then you measure your insulin levels baseline and at certain periods after like 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. And you see the, 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 what the curve looks like with that. And that's a pretty sensitive way to find out if you're insulin sensitive or, or not. That's probably the, I would say the most accurate. Realistically though, you could just do a, a the simplest one is just do a fasting blood sugar. If your fasting blood sugar is over 100, you're probably not insulin sensitive. Maybe metabolically inflexive. That, that, I mean, you can get a, a blood sugar measuring glucose device for uh, like seven bucks on Amazon and the strips are like a quarter. So, I mean, it doesn't cost, I mean, just a few dollars to measure your blood glucose. You don't have to go to a doctor or anything. So yeah. that's probably the easiest, but to be more definitive, you'd want to measure your insulin levels. Ideally they should be, I think below three, most people in this country are over 10. So, uh, and it might, the, the units might be different in Europe. I don't know, but in the U S that's what they are. Yeah. 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 So yeah, like metabolic flexibility just kind of, describes your body's ability to swap between a few sources and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, like uh, do, measuring measuring your fasting insulin just uh, points out that uh, you're supposed to be fasting during the night and uh, because you're not eating your blood sugar should be low your body should go into ketosis and start burning your own body fat and in the morning that's why your blood sugar and the insulin should be low uh, but if, but if they're not then that kind of indicates maybe some like pre-diabetes uh, or just the uh, metabolic inflexibility where your body doesn't make the switch and uh, doesn't go into that uh, ketosis and uh, fat burning state. Yeah, I want to thank you too, because the last time I think I interviewed you for your new book, um, we discussed uh, cyclical ketosis and you, the discussion helped me understand a bit better of the uh, frequency of cycling. I w my, my periods of cycling were too long. Mm. And uh, you had suggested they should be shorter and think you're dead on, spot on. I would like, go for a week or two in either high carb or low carb mode. And then that was just not the right strategy. So it should, you know, you could be switching several times a week. And what I've noticed, are you familiar with a ketone measuring device called Biosense? Yeah, I have heard of it. Yeah, have you ever used it? It's pretty cool. Um, I haven't used it, but I've used like yeah. some other breath uh, analyzers. Yeah, they've got ketonics out there, but that's a piece of that is not as good and it's not, it's not as sensitive and it's not as accurate. So this one is really cool. It measures the same thing. They're both measuring breath acetone, uh, which is pretty, but this is really sensitive. Uh, and Dom really likes it. You should call, call the company. I'm sure they'll send you one out. So, 
you can play with it yourself. But but what I found is it, it basically gives you a number from zero to 40 and it's like 10% of what your ketone level is in millimoles. So like if you get a, a 25, that means you have 2.5 millimoles of ketones. So, and there's just blow into it and it really tells you what it is. So you can use that to see exactly where you, where you are in ketosis, which is pretty cool. And I usually measure mine twice a day. And I know, I, see, I can't really take carbs more than two, three days in a row. If I do, then my ketones go down. Typically my ketones are run about two millimoles and may go up to three or four, at two, two millimoles at night and then three or four in the morning. But if I have carbs for three days, it'll be like point it'll be 0.5. <laughs> so, uh, but I did, I understood that by doing the measurement and I suspect that's just true for me and everyone might be different depending on what their circumstances are, but that's a really cool trick I learned to personally optimize your cycling frequency. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, I do agree that, you know, ketosis is a great way to achieve metabolic flexibility by just producing your carbs and uh, teaching your body to tap into ketosis. But at the same time, if you, if you are like chronically in ketosis, then your body, uh, kind of loses the ability to utilize the carbs as effective as well. So that's where you're going. That's why you want to, you know, cycle it um, in some way to in reintroduce the carbs, so that your body would, you know, burn uh, both of the fuel sources uh, effectively and uh, as as well as like speed up the rate at which you can uh, make those switches. Because um, you know, every everyone could probably readapt, but if it takes like two weeks for you to get used to ketosis or uh, vice versa, then uh, that's a sign of like a slight uh, inflexibility and uh, like glucose intolerance. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So with respect to metabolic flexibility, the other two strategies, of course, if you're familiar with, I mentioned earlier, was time-restricted eating, which is a powerful intervention. You don't really, just restricting it to six to eight hours, I think is incredible. I mean, not everyone has to do a seam line and do a one meal a day or two hour a day. I, I think that when you're young and healthy like you are, it's probably a good idea but the older you get and especially the more yeah. metabolically injured you are i don't think it's a good strategy i think six right. to eight hours is, is a good window and i think we both agree on that yeah uh you know so that's a i mean and, and that works even if you're eating crap even if you're eating these vegetable <laughs> seed oils. Yeah. i mean so, so uh, we don't recommend it we recommend of course improving the food choices but it's a powerful intervention crazy yeah yeah, yeah you can get away with uh some damage uh to a certain point because of the during the fastest state, your body just uh, repairs the damage that you do cause. But yeah, like probably avoiding it is uh, the easiest thing and the most effective thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing you're a big advocate of and you do a really brilliant job of encouraging people to do is integrate resistance training or strength training into the program because you need muscle mass. The muscle it, it ha holds the most amount of glucose. And if you, when you're eating those carbs and if you want to lower your carbo uh, glucose peak after postprandially, the best way to do it is have a large muscle mass because it'll transport it right into the muscle. And it, yeah. so you, it's harder to get high glucose levels if you have high muscle mass. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, yeah, just also just protect against uh, any, any, this, you know, like the sarcopenia and muscle wasting that occurs, especially if you're yeah. like not, well, not, not using and being sedentary. Yeah, you just don't have to worry that about people your age, but uh, you know, we have to hit 50, that becomes a real, real issue. And 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 um, sadly, most younger people don't fully appreciate the, the damage and what a disaster frailty is. I had both of my parents passed away from frailty. And uh, even though I was encouraging them to exercise and stuff, it, they still, you know, because there's so many things that go on to contribute to it. In addition to exercise, of course, you have the issue with... Uh, you, need, you actually need a higher protein requirement when you get older because it's more difficult to assimilate that into the muscle. And most people don't address that, so they just lose their muscle mass like crazy. And it's just, you get on this rapid downhill course that's just so difficult to overcome. And it, it will rapidly accelerate the, the length of time that you're, not, or the amount of time you're going to be here is not going to decrease it by doing that. So yeah. real important strategy. Yeah, definitely. Protein is uh, important and uh, like, are there any other, maybe, maybe like other vitamin D foods that have a uh, sufficient amount of vitamin D in it? Uh, there are foods that have them like cod liver oil and things. Uh, but typically most cod liver oils are actually supplemented with additional vitamin D and vitamin A. So it doesn't really come naturally in super high levels, but liver typically tends to be the highest of vitamin D. So you in my view, you really weren't designed to eat, get, you know, to, uh, 
optimize your vitamin D levels by food. You're really supposed yeah. to do it from sunshine. And the other benefits of sun exposure is not just vitamin D. You also be, are exposed to um, infrared radiation, so near infrared and infrared, and that will help optimize your nitric oxide levels, which are also, that's, an, that's actually a free radical that has, of course, many important modulating benefits on your blood pressure and other, other tissues. So, uh, and then it structures the water in your body. So if people drink structured right. water, but it's far, far better to structure the water through exposure right. to, to near infrared radiation. So. Mm, yeah, that's, that's, I didn't know that. That's a, that's a good uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, simple, simple strategy. Yeah, do, but does the UV radiation also have like any antiviral effects? Oh yeah, well, it does. Uh, but there, it's, it, it, UV pen, UV pen, rays don't penetrate very deeply, just a few millimeters. So it would only be a topical effect, but you can use UVC, which doesn't really come down too much into earth because at about yeah, 15,000 feet or so, there's too much atmosphere and it just, it just can't penetrate the atmosphere. So, uh, but UV, they, they actually use UV, UVC lights because UV is A, B, and C, and C is the shortest wavelength, the one that's most germicidal. And they, that's well documented and approved for germicidal actions. They're, they're disinfecting planes with it. So, uh, yeah, you definitely can do it. But the way it works for its antiviral or antipathogenic actions is by activating the production of vitamin D in the body. It does, it's, so it's an indirect effect. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like just during the, even like during the Spanish flu uh, pan pandemic, uh, they uh, treated a lot of people with just the fresh air and the sunlight. So oh, yeah. the people that are taken outside and... Uh, yeah, it had like a I think, substantial effect. I think in the early 1900s, uh, there was a guy named Nils Finson, who was from your area of the world, who treated tuberculosis and actually got a Nobel Prize for using just sunlight to treat, treat tuberculosis successfully, which was really the only way they could do it. There's a lot of people who, had, who died or suffered severe consequences from tuberculosis, which is still a very common infection. Mm -hmm. And that worked. It's, co it's come out, fell out of disfavor when they the, discovered antibiotics, but it clearly works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our bodies can do, and, and, it work, and it work, and it works through another mechanism, which I failed to mention. It increases something called AMPs, which are antimicrobial peptides. Uh, that's what vitamin D does, and it does. There's two specific ones, uh, uh, things like cathelicidin, uh, and in humans, it's LL37. It's a really potent antimicrobial. Hmm. I mean, it's just like po more potent than many antibiotics. Yeah. So you can get it for free when you get vitamin D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Vitamin D is also like one of those uh, central, uh, like it's it's not just vitamin, it's a hormone and yeah, partakes yeah. in virtually all, all, almost all the processes in the body, including like just the antioxidant defense me mechanism and antiviral defense mechanism and yeah, just hormones and uh, everything related. So yeah, it's, uh, you need to have it optimized <laughs> no matter what. Absolutely. So there's another strategy that you can do that I mentioned earlier that I wanted to touch on. But so, and this isn't discussed at stopcovidcold.com. So again, I hope you consider recommending that to your friends and family and passing it along so that we can spread the word and maybe even target specific populations like the black population and elderly in the nursing homes so they can get this information out there and so they don't have to suffer needlessly and die on a, you know, ridiculous from, from an infection they didn't have to. So, but one of the, if they do for whatever reason, again, this is, this is now we get into the treatment phase, you know, in the US, um, they have actively uh, vil villainize or vilify any strategy, even if it's a drug that's been used for decades on millions of people with virtually no side effects like hydroxychloroquine, it's vilified. Because it's a competitor to their, their, what they want to do, or, or because Trump said it, he liked it. So either way, uh, it does work. It tends to, it's hydroxychloroquine works with zinc. It doesn't work without zinc, and it has to be done early in the course. I'm not. I mean, that's one way to do it. I think it's you know it can, it can help. I don't think it's the magic bullet. I'm going to tell you what I think the magic bullet is. But you, as an alternative, you like hydroxychloroquine, you and you can't get it. For whatever reason, you can use quercetin, which is a poly, a, a flavonoid, bioflavonoid, and has many of the same benefits of, of uh, hydroxychloroquine, which essentially drives zinc into the cell, where it stops the viral replication, replication especially if given early in the illness. And, uh, but it has other benefits, too, that you would be interested in. Of course, you know, quercetin is used as a senolytic. Yeah. Uh, it it uh, 
in right concentrations can decrease senescence or zombie cells in the body, which tend to increase inflammation. So it has that benefit. And also activates SARS to, uh, or uh, SIR2, yeah. one of the longevity proteins. So, uh, and it has independent anti-inflammatory components, which none of, none of those actions are available with hydroxychloroquine. And it's, it's less expensive and it has virtually no side effects. So it's, it's a winner, I think. Yeah. Uh, but, but if you, if you do get sick, as I, I just recently interviewed Dr. David Bronstein in the U S who's about my age and has been using this intervention since 1995. He's a real pioneer in this. And the, and the intervention is really simple. Uh, and it's called nebulized hydrogen peroxide. Now he has a whole variety of other things he uses with it, but really the key core to it working is this nebulized hydrogen peroxide. Have you heard of that before? Uh, yeah, I think I think actually heard uh, that podcast as well where, where you're talking okay, about. Okay, yeah, it. yeah. So it's it's, I, you know, he treated and published a trial of over 107 patients successfully. No one went to the hospital. No one died with this intervention. And interesting, during the interview I discussed with him, we actually had the same experiences because I've I've helped a few people with it, not as many as he has, because I'm not seeing patients. He's seeing patients, and uh, so you know what what we have both observed is that these individuals were short of breath they felt like they were going to die they were coughing and had a fever i mean they were really really sick right and they tried a bunch of things and they were getting better you know it's interesting that most of the people in these circumstances they almost invariably every single one of them were taking aspirin tylenol or ibuprofen or all of them mm. You know, because they think a fever is dangerous. They don't understand yeah. and realize that is a way exactly what your body's doing to beat this, this infection. So they suppress it and they call it, that, that's one of the worst things you can do. So obviously you have to stop that. But once, once they, inter, they in, implemented this uh, nebulized peroxide, literally within hours, almost every one of those symptoms disappeared. The shortness of breath, the sense of the impending death, it's crazy. It was just wow. almost magical. I've never seen anything like it. You know, I've been practicing since 1985, which is a while, uh, 35 years. And you know, from a, with respect to a successful clinical intervention for a specific illness, I've never seen anything as effective. So that that's what I would recommend. And it's and it, the dose of peroxide is really really small. Ideally, you use food grade peroxide, but the, if you, the one you buy at the drugstore for a dollar is like 3%, that mm -hmm. is 30 times too higher. So you got to dilute it 30 to one, 30 to one. So, and you dilute it with ideally normal saline, which could just be clean distilled water or purified water and a little bit of sea salt into it. That makes normal saline because you don't want to inhale distilled water. It's not a good idea. Right. Um, so and then you dilute the peroxide with that. And you in, inhale it and it's just nebulized. So yeah, and the, the other fine point is that you need to get like a real nebulizer because you can go to Amazon and get these nebula, these handheld ones with batteries for like $25. Those don't work. You, mm -hmm. you need a desktop one that plugs in the wall. Those are closer to a hundred. And um, then you, uh, you want to make sure that it has a, a face mask instead of a uh, breathing tube or mouthpiece. So it would, the mouthpiece would probably work, but this infection, when you get it, it's not just in your lungs. It's primarily in your lungs, but you can also get it in your nasal cavity, your nasal passages and your sinuses. So you want to make sure you're treating those too. And you can't do that with a mouthpiece. You have to have a face mask. Yeah. So you just do that. And, you know, you keep it on your home. It's good for you and your family. And if someone else needs it, you just disinfect it before you use it. But you know, almost, you almost don't have to because the peroxide is going to sanitize it by itself, you know, so it's, you know, you're, you're, the, the, the peroxide is, is a virucidal. I mean, it clearly topically works to kill the virus, no question. Mm. But it probably works in a variety of ways because you know your body has the ability to generate hydrogen peroxide itself. I mean, that's the way yeah. your immune cells actually defeat infections. They have, there's an enzyme called NADPH oxidase or NOx which actually creates hydrogen peroxide, actually consumes NAD too, or actually converts the NADPH to NADP, which is not a good thing because you want a lot of NADPH. So it can sucks up your NADPH, but in the process of doing that, it creates this uh, hydrogen peroxide. And, and locally, 
uh, targeting these these pathogens to destroy them, and that's how your body does it. And this work pro works probably pretty similarly, but may actually work topically too to get the peroxide actually into the lungs and where the, the, the virus might be residing and just kill it like in direct contact, but at the right concentration. Because you, you know, too much of it, you need the Goldilocks dose. You don't want to have too much. You don't want to cause any cellular damage in your body. You want just the smallest amount of dose that would work. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's almost like uh, anything in the immune system and the body as well. The, like there's this Goldilocks, Goldilocks yeah. and uh, too much of anything can be bad and too little is also unwanted. Yeah, and Brownstein spent a lot of time, as I said, he was doing this for 25 years and uh, played around with the doses is a lot and found that uh, he actually recommends, I, I say 0.1%, he goes like half of that 0.04% because he found that was an even lower dose at work. But, you know, I just, it, it, they're close enough. They both are, are pretty low, but it, I mean, one is 30 times lower, the other is uh, 60 times lower than, than the normal one, but they're still really low is the key point. Uh, but if you get lower than 0.04%, it probably is not gonna work. That's at least in his research, anecdotal yeah. clinical research. Yeah, are there any, any other like um, things that you yourself are doing uh, to keep yourself like optimized, your immune system and uh, resilience? Oh yeah, sleep, sleep is of course one of the most important, you know, that's, that's key. And you know, one of the cool thing that I learned, you probably know it, but I might remind other people that who don't know of it, um, to optimize your deep sleep is to take a cold shower or take, in my case, I just jump in my pool before I go to bed. And that lowers your bo core body temperature and allows you to get more deep sleep, which is pretty simple, inexpensive hack. Yeah. Uh, so th that's a good strategy I use. Uh, I mean, it's huge. It, it tripled my deep sleep. It's wow. crazy. <laughs> um, so that, uh, you know, for immune things, um, Certainly vitamin D levels, sun, sun exposure, sauna. I love sauna. I do the sauna every day. I have got an interesting hack on the sauna. I use um, a near and a far infrared sauna and I heat it up to 170 first, which is unusual. Most saunas don't go up that high, but mine does, the one I'm using. So I heat it up to 170 first. And once it's 170, then I turn it off and then I turn on my near infrared sauna space bulbs. <laughs> So I, I'm using the sauna space bulbs in 170 degree sauna, at least, in, I mean, obviously the temperature was down a little bit, but that boy, that kicks your butt because that, <laughs> because the, the, the sauna space bulbs, they're, they're, they're heat lamp bulbs and they, they definitely go into your body because there's, there's about 15% of those frequencies that are near infrared and it goes straight in You're, and you start sweating literally within a minute. I, I probably lose about a pint or maybe even more water in about 20 minutes. So oh. it's, uh, I'm drenched when I come out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so heat. that's, yeah. Yeah, the heat so is that, also that, amazing for yeah antiviral effects and uh, just the strength of the immune system. Yeah, and I pretty much do that every day. Uh, that's a good strategy. Uh, now, what, what's another sup? There's a few other supplements the zinc I mentioned, but uh, one that works really well, especially in late stage disease, would be NAC. Um, there's a protocol that's been used in the hospitals for sepsis. It's called MATH. M A T H. Maybe MATH plus. And the, the, each letter stands for intervention. So the M is methylprednisolone, which is a steroid. The A is ascorbic acid. So they use vitamin C intravenously, not very high doses, uh, but they use that. The T is thiamine or vitamin B1, which is also given IV. Uh, the H is heparin, uh, which is an anticoagulant, an intravenous or intramuscular anticoagulant. And typically it's given because there are vast uh, hematologic complications that may actually be one of the most serious complications of a, of a SARS-CoV-2 infection that results in clotting. And it turns out that you, you could use heparin, but there's something, that's, there's a supplement that's a lot safer and uh, has many other benefits, which is NAC, N-acetylcysteine, mm. which actually uh, has these disulfide, these sulfur uh, components to it that uh, bind to the sulfurs and these von Willebrand factors, which are uh, form, the, form these platelet aggregations and it, it breaks them up, which is really cool. So if you got, if you, if you were late in the course, I would, I would be crazy not to use NAC. In fact, it's so effective that the, the FDA is looking at actually turning it into a drug. Right. Uh, and technically it is used as a drug. So you may not be aware of this, but people, if you're in an emergency room and you overdose on Tylenol, what that does is it uh, just overwhelms your liver and uh, it depletes your glutathione stores. So if you die from Tylenol overdose you, or acetaminophen overdose, 
um, it's usually because glutathione deficiency. So they use intravenous NAC and it actually works like gangbusters. And that's, that's the recommended therapy for emergency rooms is intravenous NAC, NA, NAC for acetaminophen uh, overdose. So it kind of technically is being used as a drug, even though it's a nutrient. Uh, you know, it's one of the few, few amino acids that has sulfur in them. Uh, so it, it makes glutathione and, you know, help. whereas heparin will just uh, dissociate those bonds and, the, and the, decrease the cl clotting risk. It doesn't increase glutathione at all like NAC does. Yeah. And decreases, obviously, secondary inflammation because that's what the glutathione does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So it's uh, vital to keep your like own body's um, antioxidant defense systems active, like which the glutathione yeah. is and uh, kind of self-regulated also based upon like what's necessary instead of like, yeah. You know, O overdosing. Well, you're right. You're right. And, and if you're healthy and metabolically flexible, then you'll be creating plenty of NADPH. And that will recycle and recharge your endogenous glutathione without having to take it exogenous NAC. So, but most of the people who are sick, they're not that healthy. So that's why giving up some NAC is useful. But, but ideally, I think in an ideal world, you just, you just upregulate your NADPH and that will recharge your own glutathione. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, it's been. <laughs> great to talking with you like is there anything uh, that we didn't talk about that we should or mention no 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 just a reminder that stopcovidcold.com is really the key resource uh, uh, you just go there take the test yourself and then spread it to as many people if you're on social media or your friends if you have any other networks or platforms you know just share that freely uh, and said there's no strings attached no emails required no opt-in so it's a really really powerful strategy you can use to really spread the word about vitamin d yeah, definitely. We'll put all the links in the show notes. And uh, yeah, uh, last time we talked, uh, I also asked like, what's the one thing that you wish you adopted sooner or have it? Uh, but I, I wanna this time I wanna ask like, uh, is what's the one thing that you wish you adopted before the pandemic, so to say, before twenty twenty? <laughs> before twenty twenty, hmm. There's a good answer to that. Nothing pops into my head right now. Uh, Well, I think, you know, actually, I think when I interviewed you, that was post. So, you know, one of the things is uh, really just the optimization of protein levels and the cycling, I guess, probably personally would be the biggest change I would have liked to have known about sooner. Probably that's it, I would think. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah it's, 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 it's such a powerful thing. I mean, it's, it's an advanced fine tuning component, but really important one, you know, because yeah. you could be doing everything right. But you know, these whole things you've got to, and listen to what your body tells you, everyone's different. So, you know, to look for these objective parameters to guide your choices and those just don't rely on some, someone's recommendation like mine or yours or someone else's, you've got to fine tune it for your individual needs. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so yeah, it's been great talking with you and uh, looking forward to your future work and uh, we'll leave all the links to the, uh, to the website down below. Yeah, maybe I'll see you next year. Well, I mean, I was, was, I was <laughs> going to see you at two events this year, but, it, you know, I, yeah. I had to cancel half a dozen plane tickets this year. And I have not traveled since March. I had, I had two flights this year in January and March, and that was it. I stopped flying in March, so like most people. Mm. But uh, I, <laughs> yeah. at some point we'll connect. If they open it, open, things open up again. Although, you know, I tell you, this, in the U.S., probably the scariest thing is this election coming up. It is yeah. just, <laughs> it could be mayhem in here. We've had a lot of problems with riots, but I mean, that could be just the tip of the iceberg once this election, uh, after November 3rd in the U.S. I mean, it's just, oh, yeah. I, I shudder to think what could happen. I mean, it, it does not look pretty. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a mayhem. And uh, yeah, let's hope yeah. for the best. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. All right, Sim. All right, I'll see you around.